Greetings, beloved, and again, welcome to Warshow. What a joy to share this moment with you. Let's go ahead and look right into our scripture this morning. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, and also get in the Gospel of John, John chapter 1, 12 through 16. First, from Ephesians 3, 1 through 6. The mystery of the gospel revealed. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me, given to you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostle and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that Gentiles are the fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Let me read that again, verse number six. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. All right, turn with me to John chapter 1, 12 through 16. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. The word became flesh and lived among us. We have seen his glory the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. In verse number 16, From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Verse 16, for from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Lord, bless this word as we share it in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul is writing this wonderful epistle, this wonderful letter, as you already have been shared with to a number of churches in the region of Ephesus. Ephesus is located in what is now modern-day Turkey. Paul spent a lot of time there, as you're aware. He spent close to two years there investing in relationships and sharing the gospel, helping to build community churches and helping non-believers come and become believers. There was an influx uh, in this uh, region of those who accepted Jesus, Jewish, uh, Jews and Gentiles alike. Recall it was the center of many of the Greek gods and so people were hungering for knowledge of God and how to connect to God. And Paul's basic message is that through Jesus that all were welcomed into the family of God. What a tremendous message. Through Jesus the Christ, all were welcomed into the covenant family of God. I don't want to pass over this too quickly because you've got to remember that Paul is talking out of a thousand plus years of Jewish history. Paul himself, a Jew, and having been trained in the highest uh, educational strata of what it meant to be a Jew, 
having now been transformed by his encounter with Jesus on the Damascus Road, he is now a gospel herald. But he's still a Jew. And Paul, having now experienced Jesus and now having been called and sent to the Gentile world, he runs into opposition from other Jews who are also believers. And they say, Paul, we see this wave of new believers coming, these Gentiles, and you're reaching outside of our families and they're coming in waves. But Paul, we also accepted Jesus and we also want to follow him. We're also following him. But these non-Jews, these Gentiles, they don't know how to follow him. And what happens is the Jewish Christians in the first century, not all, but many of them uh, referred back to what it meant to be a Jew. And they said, well, you got to eat this way. and You've got to dress this way. And you've got to follow our culture. And you've got to become what we are. And this created a great conflict. And ultimately, this is what will get Paul arrested because Paul was forthright in his understanding. His understanding was simply all are welcomed by faith in Jesus. Let me say it again. All are welcomed by faith in Jesus. None would be excluded based on national origin or origin or tribal affiliation or history or culture or language. No, all would be invited into the family of God. And what an extraordinary notion, what an extraordinary uh, uh, calling, what an extraordinary uh, family in a world that is dominated by tribal, tribalism and cultural allegiance and segregation and separation and all of the stuff that we still see to gay today. What an uh, audacious statement to say by faith in Jesus that the walls of the vision can be broken down. That in Christ, there is a oneness. In Christ, there's only one human family. And that all are connected, that all who accept him by faith become children of God. And God is our Father. And to this day, this revolutionary concept, even struggling in our modern world to find rootage and to grow because we are so self-centered, we are so ego-centered that the flesh and the nature of sin continues to dominate and we're constantly looking for ways to say that we are better than somebody else. But here, Paul speaks of this great mystery. This great mystery. What is this great mystery he's talking about? This mystery of how can a person who is born a non-Jew, how is it that you are able to be included into the family of God? I know 2,000 years of history has softened this concept, but if you talk to some Orthodox Jews even today, this question will come up. How is it that you believe that you have the right, the audacity to claim to be children of God. And even in Jewish sects right now, there's still debate and argument, and I won't get into that, versus the Ethiopian Jew and the Middle Eastern Jew. And there's debate and argument about the African Jew and uh, uh, what color the Jew is and the race and all of this stuff, dividing lines. But Paul says all of this is washed away in Christ Jesus. He says, this is the mystery. Now remember that Paul's writing from a prison cell. Remember that he's a prisoner. And remember in verse number three, Paul says, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. 
On behalf of the Gentiles, Paul says, I'm locked up. Because Paul was dealing with this conflict in the Jewish church. And this is what got him locked up. He says, at Paul, on behalf of the Gentiles. The first century Christians wanted everyone to become like them. They wanted them to become as they were, as a way to accept Jesus of Lord, as Lord. Many of them were caught up in their tradition, their culture, their Old Testament reading and understanding of how to get to God. And they accepted Jesus, but they wanted to hold on to their old way of doing things. And does that not sound familiar? Is that not what happens with us? That we want to hold on to our old ways? That we want to hold on to our yesterdays? That we believe that the things of the past are religious traditions, that we can keep them and many of them have been co-opted into the Christian faith? And yet when Jesus comes, he makes all things new. Somebody typed it in this morning. He makes all things new. When Jesus comes, he calls me out of my yesterday into my tomorrow. When he comes, he calls me to examine my old traditions and my old thinking and hold it up under the light of the gospel. And if it cannot stand the light of the gospel, I hear Jesus saying, let it go and release it. Do not be people of superstition. Do not be people of fear. Fear. Do not be people who run and hide in the darkness and in the shadows. There's no greater power than the power of God. And so as old saints would say, I looked at my hands and my hands look new. I looked at my feet and my feet look new. I got a new mind and I got a new walk and I got a new talk. And that's what happens when Jesus comes. This is what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that your old traditions are not necessary to become a part of the family of God. And thus you cannot exclude others because they don't sing like you and they don't dress like you. <clears throat> and they don't eat the food that you eat. And they don't have your accent and they don't have your family lineage. No, you cannot exclude them from the family of God. They are God's children. And Paul is immersed in this notion of trying to help these young Christians to understand their new identity. That's right, type that in, a new identity. And beloved, let's just make it clear right off the bat, make it clear and simple that we are known as the children of God. I am a child of God. Type it in, I am a child of God. My greatest identity is that I belong to God, that God is my father, that I'm a child of God, created in the image of God. No, no, no. I'm a child of God created in the image of God. America wants to define me based on ethnicity, but ethnicity cannot define me. Tradition cannot define me. Culture cannot define me. Even national boundaries cannot define me. I am a child of God first and foremost, first and last. This is who I am. I will not simply be limited by the categories of this world. I am a child of God. There you go. Don't let the world limit you, beloved. Be who God created you to be. When you put your trust in Jesus and when you accept him by faith, this is the only criteria. Put your trust in Jesus and accept Jesus by faith and receive the new identity. That's right, the new identity that God has for you. The old identity 
is an identity of brokenness. It's an identity of selfishness, of identity of self-centeredness, an identity of sin. But in Jesus, when you put your faith in him and you trust him, then you can understand what Paul means when he writes in the second chapter of Ephesians, that by the rich mercy of God and God, God's great love, which God shared to us while we were yet dead in our trespasses, that we are alive together with Christ. He says, by grace, you have been saved. Let me say it again. By grace, you have been saved. You've been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that anyone would boast. For we've been saved by faith. When you take and have faith in Jesus, and put your trust in him. This is how you enter into the kingdom. The kingdom is not America. And all too often, we have clothed American Christianity and we've exported it into the world. We've told people that to be a Christian, you have to become an American. We wrapped Christianity up in our language. We wrapped it up in the red, white, and blue. And we said, you've got to eat like we eat and dress like we dress. And you've got to have the same identity that we have. And to do this is the same disservice that the Jews of the first century were doing to the Gentiles. It is to say and to belittle God. <clears throat> it is to make God a small idol. You cannot confine God by national boundaries or national identity. To be a Christian, you can be an American, but you also can be in Japan. You could be in Australia. You could be in Russia. You could be anywhere in the world. You could be in Europe or Africa. It's not a national thing. It's beyond any nation. How do I join? I don't join by being born in this country because I can be an American, but it doesn't mean I'm a Christian. To be a Christian, you got to be born of the Spirit. You've got to accept Jesus by faith. You got to put your trust in Him. Did you hear it? This is about the third time I said it. It's very simple. You've got to put your faith in Jesus, you've got to trust in Him. And that's what John says. In John chapter 1, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen the glory, the Son, the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And we've seen Him, and because He has come to us, we have received Jesus in the fullness of grace. That's what John says, that we've received him. And John says in John 1, 16, out of his fullness, out of his fullness, we have received him. From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. That's it. That's the key. Grace upon grace. What does that mean? That means that when he came, he came to us and we received the full measure 
of grace upon grace. We got grace when Jesus came and we got grace, more grace was given to show that God has no respecter of person. He gave out grace, but as if that wasn't enough, he heaped grace upon us. He poured grace out upon us. He gave more and more grace. Have you ever received something in a container and somebody poured it out and it filled your container and you were happy that it was filled and you said, look at the grace that God gave. And when God filled up the grace, God did not stop. God kept pouring out more grace until the grace overflowed. And so we have grace upon grace. That's what David meant when he said, my cup overflows. That is to say that God keeps pouring out God's grace. When you accept Jesus, it doesn't mean that from that point on, you're going to be perfect, but it means you got grace and you keep living in grace. But every now and then when you stumble, he pours out more grace. When you're broken, he pours out more grace. When you're disappointed, he pours out more grace. When you've fallen down and can't get up, he pours out more grace. When the enemy is against you, he pours out more grace. Grace upon grace upon grace. That's why the writer says it's amazing grace. It's unlimited grace. Grace that never runs out. It's grace. And that's how you and I became a part of the family of God. God just poured out God's immeasurable grace upon us. Grace upon grace. Amen. Amen, Pastor. Amen. Grace upon grace. I keep on going, but I'm going to stop right there. That's what we have in Jesus. We have grace upon grace, and all it takes is for you to put your faith in him. What does it say in Ephesians 2, 8 and 10? If you confess with your mouth, I'm sorry, I asked John, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Amen. That's grace upon grace. All you need is to put your faith in Jesus and trust him. Just those two things. Put your faith in him and trust him. And he will lead you. He will guide you all the way through this dangerous world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for grace upon grace. If you've not accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior, pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I accept you as my personal Savior. I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. And I trust you. Amen. I trust you. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 
grace upon grace. Listen, beloved, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, we want to connect with you. Please reach out in the chat or call us, text us, come down to the church. We're here Sunday morning, 8 and 1045. Join us in worship. We would love to have you. Check us out online, mcbaptist.org. Whatever it takes, however, but just make sure you get connected. And if Mount Carmel's not the place, then get connected to a good Bible teaching church, a good community that God's people can surround you and love you and help you to experience grace upon grace. I'm Pastor Kimbrough from Charlotte, North Carolina. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. If no one told you, let me tell you, I love you and the Lord God loves you. You are somebody extraordinary. Live to be your best loving self this day and in the week to come. And I'll look forward, God willing, to sharing with you on next Sunday morning at the same time. God bless you and have a beautiful day.